Yes, that's perfect. Okay, so everyone, uh, we're gonna start Academic Half Day. If you could please turn your cameras on. Uh, Dr. Silueta is one of our great pulmonary attendings at Mount Sinai Morningside and Chief of the Division. Uh, he's gonna talk to us a little bit about lung cancer screening and lung nodules. Okay, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, it is a real honor. Um, I mean that. Um, I, thank you for being here. Next, next week, it's going to be a year since I arrived uh, to Mount Sinai from, from Spain. And, um, and I have to say that uh, one of the things that has impressed me most is, is your program. So, um, you know, I've worked with a few of you, and, and that's been quite impressive. And then in general, the, the, the work that you guys do that I can see when I'm on service and that I hear about is really impressive. So congratulations for that. Okay, so I'm going to be talking uh, about lung cancer screening, um, and at the end, I'll talk a little bit about lung nodules. Uh, I have been doing lung cancer screening for many years as part of the ILCAP uh, consortium, which you might have heard of, uh, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but it's based here at Mount Sinai, and I actually joined this consortium back in the year 2000 when it was based at Cornell. Um, I was led by uh, Dr. Claudia Henschke and Dr. David Yankelevich, two radiologists uh, right now at Mount Sinai Hospital, um, and they started this whole thing. And they're actually, you know, you can give them the credit for uh, where lung cancer screening is today and, and the fact that we're talking about it. They, they really are the pioneers, so uh, we have to keep that in mind. Um, before, oh, this doesn't, okay, there you go. Um, these are my disclosures. I'm a consultant for a company that uh, works in this space. And I uh, was a former employee for a, a period of time in a biotech company uh, that also works in this space. So um, I am quite interested in this area, um, although uh, there's no conflict uh, of interest with, with respect to what I'm saying today. So we, you know, you know about lung cancer and, and how bad it is. I mean, just a very quick uh, overview uh, of, of the statistics, and I'm using uh, the SEER database for that, which is the largest uh, cancer database in, in, in the world, basically, um, and it's a U.S. data. But lung cancer is the deadliest cancer there is uh, here in the U.S. It causes 135,000 deaths um, a year. That number is declining slowly, but still, it's, it beats the next three cancers um, added together. Um, it's a real bad disease. And if we, if we count USA, Europe, and China, that's a million deaths a year. You can put that into perspective, knowing you know, that COVID has killed 5 million people in two years. Obviously, you know, not comparable uh, diseases or situations, but it gives you an idea of how bad lung cancer is. I mean, this is because lung cancer does this, does this every single year. And, and this is without counting uh, Africa, South America, um, uh, Australia, et cetera, places where, where, where the mortality is also very elevated. So it's a very, um, pro it's a very big problem around the world. And the reason is this, if you look at the statistics of survival and diagnosis, most of the lung cancers, here it says 60%, according to SEER data, there are many series that talk about 85% are diagnosed in uh, stage three or four, where lung cancer cannot be cured. Um, very few, 17% um, are diagnosed in stage one, where you have certain guarantees that you can cure the disease with surgery. Look at the five-year survival rates in the bottom curve and bottom graph, um, where it's usually diagnosed, you get less than, you know, around 5% survival in five years. This, fortunately, is changing now. It has improved a little bit. Um, if we look at overall survival, five-year survival, I'm sorry, um, over the years, you can see that now we're around 20%. Um, 10 years ago, we were below 15%. There's been some advances in therapies that you've heard of, uh, immunotherapy, et cetera, that have actually have a significant impact on lung cancer survival. But still, we're talking about really poor survival rates. And that is mainly because we're still diagnosing the disease very late. And why aren't we doing uh, early detection? Uh, it is difficult to understand, but um, let's go over the data a little bit. This is just a non-scientific graph that I, I've built over the years, looking at the publications, um, just doing a search on PubMed, and looking at the number of publications with lung cancer screening in its title. 
And you can see that up until the year 2000, uh, really there was absolutely no interest. And that is due to some studies done back in the 80s. Um, there were like three or four studies done with chest x-ray for screening of lung cancer that failed completely. Um, there are many reasons why they failed. We're not going to go into it now, but probably most, most of the reasons is because of poor design of the studies. Um, in any case, that really, you can tell that uh, no interest was uh, uh, resulted from those studies up until the year 2000 when, uh, or nine, 1999, when LCAP, Early Lung Cancer Action Program, um, led by Dr. Henschke and Dr. Yankelevich, as I mentioned, uh, published this paper in Lancet. This is 1999. What they did is they, they studied 1,000 individuals who had smoked heavily um, with a median age of, 70, of 67 years, and they did a low-dose CT, you know, a CT scan of the chest with low dose of radiation um, and a chest x-ray on all 1,000 individuals. And they did this at time zero, and then one year later, one annual CT. And this is the data from the baseline that times zero uh, low dose CT. 233, 23% of the individuals had a positive low dose CT, meaning that they had at least one five millimeter nodule without calcifications. Those are potentially cancers. Um, when you find uh, calcified nodules in the lung, those are uh, what we call granulomas or scars. They're, they're benign, they're not counted. These are non-calcified nodules and they use uh, the threshold of five millimeters to consider it positive or not. 23% were detected in low dose CT. Only 7% were detected by chest x-ray. And if we look at all these nodules, 233, 27 of them for a total prevalence of 2.7% were actually lung cancer. Only seven of those were detected by chest x-ray. So, I mean, this now sounds ridiculous because we would all uh, have put money on this result, but, but you know, that had not been published or had been seen. The main thing about this study is not so much these numbers, but these over here. 85% of those cancers were diagnosed in stage one. That is mind blowing. And, and, and I happened to bump into Dr. Henschke at a American Thoracic Society meeting as I was moving to Spain from, from Boston. I was at Tufts University and I moved to Spain and, and to my last uh, ATS meeting here in the States, I went through all the lung cancer uh, posters and whatnot, and I found her standing by a poster. She's a professor in radiology. She was standing by her poster presenting this data. She was alone. Nobody was paying attention to this. And I just couldn't believe it. I had not done any lung cancer at that time. I was moving into a new area. So I really thought it was interesting. And I'm right there is when I joined this consortium. And, and you'll see how um, that has continued. It's really amazing uh, story. So Continuing with our graph of interest in, in lung cancer screening, 1999 is when this, published, this paper was published. You can see how the interest started growing. Well, in, 19, in 2006, we published now an international LCAP paper. But let me just tell you a little bit about this. So as I said, I met Dr. Henschke. They were creating an international consortium. Um, and this ended up being uh, a consortium of up to 70 or 80 centers around the world, all doing lung cancer screening using low dose CT and with the same protocol, um, meaning that uh, the, the, the x-ray was, or the CT scan, I'm sorry, was, was done with the same uh, uh, radiation and with the same cut, uh, uh, cut thickness, et cetera. Um, and we all gathered the data into one central database. Um, we did yearly CT scans. And basically uh, the goal was to accumulate as much data as possible to see if the initial original paper from uh, LCAP uh, was actually uh, validated or confirmed. And this paper came out in 2006 in the New England Journal of Medicine. So after we had done 31,000 baseline screenings and 27,000 annual screenings, meaning people who came back to have a second, third, or fourth screening, we had diagnosed a total of 484 cancers. I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but again, the data, the, the, the most important data point is the fact that 85% of these cancers were diagnosed in stage one. I just showed you that even today, in any series that you find outside of lung cancer screening or the SEER data, uh, the, the percentage of people diagnosed in stage one is, is around 15%. 
So this is a game changer. And we're talking about 2006, many, many years ago. And if you look at the 10-year survival rate of these patients, not five years, 10-year survival, um, look at the blue line here. We're talking about 80%. Again, I just told you that uh, if you look at any series, the, the, the five-year survival rate of lung cancer in the States is less than 20% or around 20%. Back then it was less than 15%. So this is really uh, data that's really amazing. And it's incredible that having been published in 2006, this is not taken on like fire and, 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 and we should all be doing screening, but we, we didn't. One of the main reasons was because that, that study that we did was without a control arm. So it was criticized quite a bit, meaning uh, because we could not, prove that that increased survival would result in a reduction in mortality. You needed a control arm where you did not do any screening to, to, to make that claim. However, we said, listen, you know, you're going from a 15% survival in five years to an 85% survival in 10 years. You don't need that. Um, however, um, uh, you know, evidence-based medicine is what it is. And today, unless you have a randomized control trial um, for everything, um, it is impossible to get something uh, accepted. So a randomized control trial called the NLST was designed. It was designed actually way uh, before ILCAP was published. It was designed when LCAP was published. Um, and this, you know, prior to COVID, NLST was one of the most expensive uh, or costly trials uh, ever done in the U.S., $250 million. Of course, the COVID vaccine has uh, shattered that record. Um, but that very expensive trial, uh, 50,000 people um, who had smoked 30-pack years of uh, cigarettes or uh, and had quit less than 15 years ago if they were former smokers, were included and, and, and randomized to two groups, an interventional arm, where they did annual load OCT at time zero, and then one year later and another year later, three years in total, and control arm where they did annual chest X-ray. So the control is not no screening. It's, it's screening with an annual X-ray, thinking that X-ray doesn't work, and that's why they use it as a baseline. But that might be a problem. And the goal was to find a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality, difference between the two groups. Before uh, uh, planned, it had to be halted because that 20% mortality reduction had been uh, uh, reached. And also they found an all-cause mortality reduction of 7%. This is the, the cumulative uh, number of lung cancer deaths uh, in, the, uh, in the trial. And, and you can see the 20% uh, difference between low dose CT and chest X-ray throughout the six years of follow-up after the first three rounds of screening. Now, this raises a question here, only 20% reduction in mortality when we just, I just told you that there's an 85% survival rate in 10 years. Well, let's look at the data a little more closely. If you look at the screening years or period of screening, which was round zero, round one, and round two, over a period of two years, 679 cancers were diagnosed in the low dose CT arm. And the, the stage distribution was 64% in stage one and two, not 85% like an LAL cap, but still incredibly different than what the norm is, and 36% in advanced stages. However, the patients, the entire group was then followed for a total of six years without any more screening. And more lung cancers were diagnosed in these follow up period, in this follow-up period. The stage, look at it, it shifted back to more advanced stage than earlier stage, these 361 cancers, which is two thirds or one third, I'm sorry, of the total number of cancers. So this obviously has to dilute the beneficial effect of, the, of, of lung cancer screening. In any case, the goal was to reach 20% and it was reached. So now, um, why wasn't uh, lung cancer screening uh, implemented widely after that? Difficult to understand. Um, many people said that we need more studies to confirm, whatnot. And this, I'm going to show you two large studies that have been done in Europe that basically validate all the results that I'm showing. This is one of the most important ones, the second largest randomized control trial after NLST. 15,000 individuals were randomized into two groups, intervention arm where they did low dose CT at time zero, one year, three years, and then 5.5 years. 
after time zero for different uh, periods to see if maybe we can go more than uh, a screening every year. Maybe we can do it every two years, see what happens. And then control arm where they did not do any screening whatsoever. And the goal here was 25% reduction in mortality. And it was also found 10 years after follow-up, 25% um, of 26% uh, in males, uh, less deaths, whereas uh, in women, it was almost 40%. Although in women, it did not reach statistical significance, mainly because uh, the number of, uh, of women participating in this trial was, was not that high. But in any case, this validates and confirms the re results of the NLST. Then the mild study from uh, Italy, 4,000 individuals, um, again, showed a significant reduction in mortality when you look at the follow-up over 10 years, but they did something interesting um, from a methodological point of view is that what happens if we analyze starting at year five instead of looking at the entire uh, period of time, meaning because maybe this initial period is influenced by cancers that are originating before the screening starts. And look what happens. Actually, the mortality reduction is much greater. Um, this is a statistical uh, method called landmark analysis. It's accepted, and uh, it probably makes a lot more sense. And I think probably reflects that the reduction in lung cancer uh, mortality uh, with screening, if you do screening more than just two times, um, is much greater than 20%. It gets closer to, to numbers uh, that we had seen in ILCAP, even though we were not looking at survive, uh, mortality reductions. Okay, so that's, that's the data, um, I think, uh, that confirms um, that lung cancer screening works. And um, thanks to that data, in the year 2013, the USPSTF finally recommended annual lung uh, cancer screening with low-dose CT to individuals that met these criteria, age 55 to 80 years, history of 30 pack years and current smokers, or those who have quit smoking in less than 15 years. These are the clinical criteria uh, used to recruit patients into the NLST trial. Um, again, this is another, uh, um, how should I say this? Another uh, problem with uh, sticking to evidence-based medicine um, so strictly. Since the randomized controlled trial was done with this criteria, what is said by people is that you cannot include people of age uh, 54 because there's no randomized control trial to show that lung cancer screening works in that group. And um, so they stuck to these uh, criteria, even though these criteria were designed or were selected for a clinical trial and not for uh, establishing guidelines for lung cancer screening. Anyway, that's just an editorial point that I add to my talk. <laughs> um, however, fortunately, the USPSTF using um, a lot of data that is not necessarily from, from randomized controlled trials has changed a bit these criteria now this last year, and they dropped the age to 50, and they dropped the amount of pack years to 20. But they still keep this third criteria, criterion, which says that if you, if you are a former smoker, you can only get screening until you reach 15 years of being a former smoker. At year 16, you're not a candidate for screening. Um, and what's the problem with these, uh, with these criteria? We, in our uh, cohort in Spain, applied them. We, we, we have more flexible criteria. We allow people uh, to enter with 40 years of age and have smoked in less amounts of uh, cigarettes. And, and they could be a former smoker uh, greater than 15 years. And what we found is that of all the cancers that we found in our cohort, more than 100, 40% would have been candidates following these criteria. 40%, more than 50% of the cancers would not have been able to be detected because they would not have been candidates to enter a screening program according to that criteria. In summary, uh, looking at the screening uh, uh, aspects, it is clear that lung cancer screening works. It improves survival rates, it produces a significant state, uh, state shift with greater early stage uh, diagnosis. It re results in a significant reduction in lung cancer mortality rates. And the different trials have shown that the more you screen, the greater the reductions in mortality. So there's no doubt about that. So you would think, okay, now I'm sure there's screening going on everywhere in the country and, and all smokers are being screened. Well, this is a report that just came out um, from the uh, uh, 
President's Cancer Panel um, wrote a, a report on the status of screening in the United States. And this is a very interesting graph. This just came out a few weeks ago. These are the rates of uptake of screening, uh, or in other words, percentage of individuals who are candidates for screening who actually undergo screening. So let's look at this breast cancer graph. You can see that since 1987, it took a little bit to build up to about 75% of women undergoing screening, and it's remained steady since then. It's a pretty decent uh, uh, number, I would say. Cervical cancer, even better. And, and also, you know, around 80%. Colorectal cancer, cancer, it's still building up, but, you know, they're close to 70% already. Look at lung cancer. In the year 2018, we're talking about 5% of people who are candidates for lung cancer screening that are actually undergoing lung cancer screening. It's really amazing. Um, and, and we could dedicate, you know, two sessions like this to discuss the, the, the reasons, um, and we don't have time, but it's, it's really fascinating. One of the main, one of the biggest problems is that as opposed to these other screening programs, this, the uh, CMS or Medicare mandates a shared decision-making consult before you do lung cancer screening, meaning that you have to sit down with the patient and tell the patient um, what the risks are of undergoing screening. Radiation, risk of overdiagnosis, um, meaning that you might detect cancers that are not deadly, which there's a lot of data showing that that doesn't happen in lung cancer, at least to, a, to a, an important degree, and that we can detect overdiagnosed cancers before we resect them because they're the ground glass nodules, the famous ground glass nodules that are usually adenocarcinoma in situ, used to be called bronchiovular carcinoma. We know how to deal with those without uh, resection. Um, you have to explain to the patient uh, that the radiation can be dangerous. All these things that are uh, things that we discuss with patients when, uh, when we see patients uh, with uh, talking about any treatment or any intervention, you always go over risks and whatnot. But they provide tools to use to show patients that are really negative. They, 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 they underline the risks in a way that many patients decide not to undergo screening. And even many primary care physicians or, uh, or providers in general just do not feel comfortable doing lung cancer screening because of those tools. And so there's a lot of work to do, and this is more uh, important in underserved areas. So this is one of my objectives here at Morningside to try to increase these rates um, on, on the west side. At the east, they're doing a pretty good job already, but here in the west, uh, we we're having a lot of uh, problems, particularly because of the population we serve. So I'm hoping that you know we can we can have an impact on these numbers in the next in, in the next few years. I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and, and later questions, if you want, we can go back to that. Um, still related to lung cancer screening, um, my group particularly uh, Dr. Juan Pablo de Torres, uh, who was with me in, in the University of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain. Um, as we were doing screening, he uh, has a special interest in COPD and emphysema. So we decided to look at our cohort of individuals who are essentially asymptomatic. They're coming for lung cancer screening. They're smokers or former smokers with, uh, without uh, symptoms of lung cancer, obviously, but really without any symptoms of COPD either. They're fairly healthy, quote unquote, individuals. And what we looked at is, see, we did spirometry on all of them and we looked at their CT scan to see if they had emphysema. And this is what we found. This is a non-proportional Venn diagram of our cohort. And, and we published this in chest in 2007 when we had like 1,200 individuals. This is updated uh, with uh, 2,500 individuals who had undergone screening. So we have our healthy smokers. That is a kind of a, a misnomer, um, but meaning that you don't have COPD and you don't have emphysema. You have, and, and that, you know, more than half of the population, 1,500 individuals were, fell in that category. Then you have your COPD population defined by spirometry, FEV1 over FEC, FEC of less than 70%, non-reversible, 628%. And then you have patients with emphysema. The emphysema visualized on the low-dose CT. The radiologist 
looks at it and says there's a little bit of emphysema or there's a lot of emphysema, but just the fact that there is emphysema, um, almost 30% of the population um, has it. And each little human figure here is a lung cancer. And you can see where the lung cancer is actually accumulated. And in fact, 81% of the lung cancers occur in people who have either COPD, emphysema, or both. And to look at it a little more scientifically, we did a, a, a multivariate uh, regression analysis to see what factors uh, were actually predicting lung cancer in our cohort. And adjusting for sex, age, pack years, et cetera, emphysema is a very, very strong predictor of lung cancer risk. You have almost threefold risk of having lung cancer if you have emphysema, adjusting again for tobacco smoking. If you put COPD and emphysema together in, in, in the analysis, COPD is pushed out. It's not significant. We know that COPD is a risk factor for lung cancer, but when you compete, when you put both COPD and emphysema in the same model, it's emphysema that takes over as the most powerful uh, predictor of lung cancer risk. This was, we published it in 2007, just the following year, um, David Wilson from Pittsburgh with a larger cohort published exactly the same results. So you, you, you know, as, as you're gonna go into many different fields, some of you will go into oncology, some of you will stay in, in medicine, um, which, which we hope you do because that is important. Um, you're gonna see that a lot of people who, who smoke, um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some data in a little bit, um, even though they don't have symptoms, they have damage of their lung. And everybody's looking for the biomarker, the, the PSA that can diagnose lung cancer or, or, or predict the risk of lung cancer. This is the biomarker, the strongest biomarker that we have today, the presence of emphysema on the low dose CT. We looked at the LCAP group in New York. This is a study that I did with Claudia Henschke. And if you have emphysema on your CT scan, you have a very, very high risk of dying from COPD. That's not surprising, surprising, but you also have a very high risk of dying from lung cancer. And even in non-smokers or passive smokers, look at, this is the prevalence of lung cancer in individuals with and without emphysema. And we broke it up into current smokers, former smokers, and never smokers. Look, never smokers without emphysema. The lung cancer risk prevalence is very low compared to the other groups. But former never smokers with emphysema have a prevalence of cancer almost as high as current smokers. So really, emphysema is a very powerful uh, biomarker. And it's important because of this. These are different lung cancer screening cohorts with a total of uh, 80,000 individuals. And you can see that anywhere between 30 to 40% of individuals without having symptoms have emphysema on their CT scan. You're gonna start hearing more and more about this um, in the future. Um, we, we, we talk about lung cancer, uh, low dose CT, I'm sorry, as, as a lung cancer screening tool, but it's becoming more apparent that it's a great tool to diagnose the three most common causes of death uh, in the world today which are cardiovascular disease, COPD, and lung cancer. So with one test, you can see coronary calcium, you can see COPD and other signs of COPD, uh, I mean, emphysema and other signs of COPD, like uh, bronchial wall thickening, et cetera, and you can detect lung cancer early. So low dose CT in the screening mode is gonna become a very popular test in the future, and I'm sure you're gonna be using it um, uh, quite a bit. And now I'm going to switch again uh, to a different topic, related but different. This is not screening anymore. Now we're going to talk about pulmonary nodules. Obviously, when you do screening, you're looking for pulmonary nodules. Um, but lung uh, pulmonary nodules are detected today more frequently outside of screening because of the numbers that I showed you. Um, and there's actually very interesting data uh, that has come out in the last few years. It was thought up until... Uh, 10 years ago, that in the United States, about 150,000 new nodules were diagnosed every year, 150,000. However, Mike, Dr. Gold from Kaiser Permanente did this study, 
which really uh, changed that statistic completely. It turned it upside down. They looked at, you know, Kaiser Permanente is a system like Mount Sinai, except that people do not leak out to other systems. They stay and they receive all their care in the Kaiser system for forever. And um, that allows to study uh, individuals or, or cohorts in a longitudinal way without um, losing them to follow up. And, and you can gather very, very useful information. So they looked at their um, number of CT studies done in the Kaiser Permanente uh, system from years 2006 to 2012, okay, seven years. Using natural language processing, they looked for all the reports of their CTs that had um, a nodule of between four and 30 millimeters. And then they analyzed those uh, CTs and they followed them. So first of all, the number, this is before lung cancer screening. So they had not in instituted any lung cancer screening yet in this uh, program. So this is just regular CTs, okay? Um, the number of CTs over the seven years uh, increased 53%. Um, the number of members in that time had increased by only 11%. So you can see that the number of CTs is increasing um, steadily. Uh, and this was back in 2013. You, this right now is, is, these numbers are even much, much higher. Um, we're all doing CTs for almost everything. So who doesn't get a CT um, right now today for whatever symptom? And the overall 30% of these CTs have an indeterminate pulmonary nodule detected, anywhere between four and 30 millimeters. He analyzed the data or they analyzed the data from their system and 5% of these indeterminate pulmonary nodules ended up being lung cancer. Extrapolating this to the US census, number of new nodules every year is not 150,000 anymore. It's estimated to be 1.5 million. And that was back with data of 2010, 2013. Um, and today we're probably talking about uh, 2 million or more. What happens to these nodules? Well, this is a study um, I did with, in combination with, or in collaboration with uh, Bruce Pience and, um, and, and these co-authors who work at Milliman. Milliman is the largest uh, actuary company in the world. Um, and if you don't know what actuaries do, um, it's, it's, uh, very, it's fascinating um, and, and, and very important work. They look at uh, databases basically. And they, they look at, um, they work in the healthcare at least, they work in with using insurance uh, uh, databases. Uh, they look at ways to maximize uh, efficiency and things like that. Very mathematical. And they're all mathematicians actually. So we looked at uh, the largest commercially insured uh, database available, uh, which they have uh, access to and looked for nodules detected in two year period for 2014 to 2016. And then we evaluated the workup done posteriorly or subsequently uh, to the detection of the nodule. Uh, 15,000 nodules had an uh, indeterminate pulmonary nodule diagnosed in the year 2014. And of them, only 36% received any type of workup after that. So if we just learned that 5% of those indeterminate pulmonary nodules could be cancer, but only 36% of the nodules detected are being worked up. You can imagine what the, you know, we go back to the initial part of the talk where 85% of lung cancers detected in the United States are late in late stages. So we wanna, we wanna change this. And what we're gonna do here at, at Monsanto Morningside, where I'm based, and we're gonna start here and, and hopefully expand this to the rest of the system if it works is using that same uh, natural language processing software that, that uh, they use at Kaiser Permanente, we're gonna identify all the indeterminate pulmonary nodules reported by a radiologist on CTs done at our center over, uh, on a daily basis. I, when I got here, the first thing they told me is that only in the ED here at Morningside, they do a hundred CTs a day. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Um, so if you, if, if you calculate the numbers, you know, there are easily 20 nodules every single day in the ED only at Morningside. And if 5% of those are, are cancer, it's very easy to calculate. You're going to have cancers almost on a daily basis that are missed because 60% of those are not followed up. So we're going to 
with a company that has this software and is going to um, provide the data in a manageable way uh, with a dashboard every day. We're going to have a navigator uh, who's going to be managing this dashboard, identifying all those patients who have a nodule detected, identifying the primary care physicians, uh, the providers. Um, if they don't have it and it's the ED, then we'll manage the, the, that patient. And, and we'll make sure that the recommendations made by the radiologist are followed, or at least that the interest, the people, uh, the interested people, I mean, meaning the PCP and the patient know about it. If they decide not to follow then then at least they knew that they had to. Um, hopefully with this, we're gonna be able to reduce the number of losses to follow up uh, significantly, and we're gonna be able to increase the number of uh, lung cancers diagnosed in stage one. This, uh, we're in the process already. We already identified the software company that's gonna work with us. We're, we're uh, starting to install it. We're hiring the, 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 the navigator. So this is hopefully gonna start um, uh, maybe in the second quarter of this year. Um, and, and I'm really, really excited about this because this can change things quite a bit. So once you detect a nodule, what do you do with it? It's not that easy. I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure that you're seeing this uh, every day in your, with your patients, you know, that you have for, for whatever, you do a CT scan and you see a nodule. And, and what do you do? Most of these nodules are small and, 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 you, and it's really difficult to, to decide. Oh, well, there are very good guidelines out there, um, some better than others. This little thing here that you see in this CT scan is a small nodule. This, I don't know, I haven't measured this, but you know, that's less than a centimeter. If you follow the ILCAP protocol, which is a protocol done for lung cancer screening, and basically is based on, on looking for growth of nodules uh, and not jumping immediately onto uh, the, 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 you know, to, to, onto surgery and to, to try to take it out or to biopsy it, but first look for growth because the great majority of those nodules are gonna be benign. If you follow the ILCAP protocol, and this is real data from that New England Journal of Medicine paper that I, I showed you initially with uh, 480 some cancers. Well, the protocol called for a biopsy in 535 patients. 92% of the time, those Bi those biopsies uh, were cancer. So that is pretty good. This data has been replicated uh, following the same uh, database, but with more patients just recently. Dr. Raja Flores, who's the head of the chair of uh, thoracic surgery for Mount Sinai, uh, did a study looking at all the um, cancers uh, that were resected in the ILCAP uh, cohort, and only 11% were uh, of, the, of the surgeries were done for benign disease. I say only 11%, you might think that that's a lot, but when I was in your situation, uh, now quite a few years ago, um, series show that more than 50% of thoracic surgeries for lung nodules uh, were for benign disease. You don't know how many tuberculosis have been diagnosed with a, with a lobectomy. And that's not the most, uh, you know, the optimal way of diagnosing the tuberculosis, obviously. So this, these numbers are very, very good. However, that's for lung cancer screening. What happens in the real world for indeterminate pulmonary nodules? Well, today we're still using guidelines like this one from the American College of Chest Physicians, um, published in, in the year 2013, quite old, actually. Um, basically, what you do is once you have a nodule, you have to assess the clinical probability of that nodule being a cancer. You can use different mathematical models. Uh, this guideline recommends the Mayo Clinic model, which was um, developed in the year 1990s um, with chest X-ray data, very old stuff and probably obsolete, but still uh, recommended. And what you have to do is divide or classify the patients into one of these three groups, either very low risk, less than 5% of, of risk of having lung cancer, low to moderate, a very wide range from five to 65%, or very high 65%. And this is a very, uh, uh, very summarized uh, uh, graph of all the recommendations in, the, in that publication that you have down here. Essentially, the very low risk you can just watch and repeat a CT scan in a period of time to look for growth. 
the low to moderate is the most difficult one because they recommend doing a PET. Um, if it's positive, you do a biopsy. If it's a negative, you put the watch for waiting. Um, if you're in the very high group, you can go directly to surgery. Well, this is really not how we do things today, even though these are the guidelines. What we usually do, if, is, if the suspicion is high enough, we'll go directly to biopsy. Um, we'll do a PET many times in the middle, but not to diagnose the nodule. The PET, when you're suspecting lung cancer, is useful for staging, not for diagnosis, because it's not specific. You know that you can get a, a positive PET with any inflammatory disease or any infectious disease. So we don't use it for diagnosis uh, or for uh, to indicate a surgery. We just use it for staging. So we do a lot of biopsies and we try to avoid surgery unless absolutely necessary um, because we want to keep the false positives uh, in surgery as much as uh, down as much as possible. So once we, we decide to do a biopsy, we have several modes um, and there are more and more uh, coming out as, as you know, in the, in the last few years, the advances have been incredible. We have percutaneous transthoracic needle aspiration. The radiologist does this. Um, in some places, pulmonologists also do it. Um, the yield is very high, 90%, but the risk of pneumothorax is also very high, you know, up to 26%. And requiring a chest tube is lower, 5%, but still, it's a pretty significant number. <coughs> Excuse me. The alternative um, is the guided bronchoscopy. I'm gonna show you a little bit about that in a second. The yield is lower, 70%, and the risk of pneumothorax is lower. So you really have to balance um, the, the risks and, and, and the yield here and, and in each particular scenario and what you have, what kind of tools you have available. Guided bronchoscopy is a pretty sophisticated, uh, it pretty sophisticated technology that not many places have. Of course, surgical biopsy, you have the highest yield, um, but you already underwent surgery and if the nodule is benign, uh, that was an unnecessary surgery. So that's just gonna say, three words about guided uh, bronchoscopy. Uh, there's many technologies coming out. Um, this, oh, the first one here, well, there are two big categories, electromagnetic navigation and non-electromagnetic navigation. The first one, um, Illumicide or super dimension is, is uh, by Medtronic and it's the one that we just acquired here at Morningside. Over at Monsanto Hospital, they use robotic bronchoscopy uh, the, called Monarch, and, and this also uses electromagnetic navigation. There is another robotic bronchoscopy by a company called ION that does not use electromagnetic navigation. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the details of all these. Uh, I'm just gonna show you our uh, technology. I'm gonna show you show and tell uh, session comes up now with a few pictures and uh, just show you how it works. and and. and Really, it's, it's really neat because it provides the opportunity to reach nodules that before we could not reach um, with bronchoscopy. Uh, there's one technique here, radial EBUS, radial endobronchial ultrasound, which is very useful and that we actually use in combination with, with uh, navigation. And I'll show you how we do that. So very simple, once you have a nodule like this one, we did this one last week. Um, you see a bronchus that arrives to the nodule, that's called the bronchus sign. Once you have a bronchus sign, you know you're almost sure you're gonna get it with uh, a navigational system. You have to understand that the bronchoscope will not reach beyond this point here. So we don't get to see the nodule with the bronchoscope. We have to use a system that will allow us to navigate. This one's fairly easy. And you know we just got the technology, so we're, we're selecting easier cases, but we can do nodules out in the periphery where you don't actually see uh, the, 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 the airways reaching there, but you see just a little bronchus near it, um, and we do reach it. The system is going to direct you to, to um, drive the, the, the working channel to the right, to the left, up or down, according to certain parameters. And essentially what you do here is you select the nodule. This is preparation of the case. Okay, this is on, on a laptop uh, in your office before you even have the patient in the OR. Um, you select the nodule, you click on it, and you get a peripheral target. Um, and now what you're going to do is you're going to select an airway. And the, well, first of all, this is the nodule that's been selected in, in, in three different uh, views, sagittal, axial, and coronal. And um, 
you now select an airway and the system automatically will, will draw you know, the pathway from the nodule to the trachea. Now, um, what we do is we take this, this uh, let me just show you the next photo, I'm sorry. We, we get, you get this picture here. This is a virtual uh, airway tree. Um, and now you go to the patient and you put the patient on a board that generates a electromagnetic field around the thorax. You plug that board into the same uh, platform where you have introduced all the data that I just show you, showed you. Then you introduce this working, uh, this channel that's connected also to that platform. You're gonna introduce it through the bronchoscope and the bronchoscope is, the, 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 the software is gonna tell you once you have, once you're in, it's going to tell you, you know, you turn right, turn left, go up, go down until you get to the nodule. And here you see that we're pointing at the nodule. This is the tip of that working channel, of this blue working channel, um, which allows you to put in through it uh, biopsy forceps or, or, or radial uh, EBUS, like I'm going to show you in a second. And here it's telling us that we're at 0.7 centimeters from the center of our target. So, you know, we, we're right there. So what we do to confirm that we're there is that we introduce the radial EBUS through that working channel. We go to the end of the, to that tip of that channel and we do an ultrasound. And this shows us here on the left, you have the typical artifact caused by the bronchial wall and air. You see these lines here. But here on the right, you see this homogeneous um, echogenic um, nodule which is the lung nodule that, you're, uh, that we're interested in biopsying. Now, this is an eccentric uh, situation of the nodule. So your needle is gonna go right here. So by, by uh, moving it around a little bit, you can actually uh, locate the center of it and start uh, biopsying it. Sometimes, even though you see it eccentric, you have some more nodule behind that you can, so what you have to do is basically start putting in the needle and, and, and testing. And what we do is we, on, the, on site, we obtain some sample, we aspirate, and right there, we give it to a cytotech who looks at it. And this is the case that we saw last week, adenocarcinoma. So, and, and you know, uh, uh, with a bronchoscopy, now we can really get very close to the full diagnosis and staging of the patient because of their lymph nodes, we would have done an EBUS. And this, uh, there's enough material to send for molecular uh, studies. So it will tell us if the patient has PDL1, EGFR, blah, 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 et cetera. Um, very, very neat technology um, that uh, um, can really change the way we do things. Uh, up uh, at the main campus, they use the robot. It's very similar in the sense that uh, it, it, it uses the same tech, not the same. Uh, accessory technologies with electromagnetic navigation um, and makes uh, allows us to reach really nodules that are very difficult to reach. So this is uh, what I have to tell you. I really thank you for your attention and um, I, I'll be happy to go in deeper uh, some other time if you're interested. And I'm also now open for any questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Silueta. That was a great presentation. So uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves or put it in the um, I actually had uh, um, two questions. So first of all, thank you so much for the talk. It was, it was great. Uh, the first question is about the difference, what exactly the MILES study did. I think, uh, I'm not sure if I got it correctly. So I think in the Nelson study, there's no difference in overall survival. The difference is only on lung cancer specific survival, uh, but it was not clear to me whether that was addressed with the mild study uh, and what's exactly the, uh, the, the difference. That's my first question. And my second question is, if there is any biological explanation on why emphysema is more related to lung cancer than COPD, whether there's anything in the kind of inflammation uh, where biologically there is any explanation for that or if there's any uh, data suggesting any, any possible explanation? So I'll start with the second question. Um, it is not known, but it's, it's an it's a association that goes beyond the coincidence of the risk factor or the etiologic factor. So it's not only that they both smoke, because when you control for smoking, 
the risk is much greater. So it's not only that. And uh, there are many theories, um, actually because of our paper, um, Dr. Uh, McGarry Houghton wrote in, in, in Nature, a piece called from bench to bedside, no, from bedside to bench, um, the other way around. So basically based on our, uh, on our paper, he, he, theor he, he brought up several possible hypotheses as to what that relationship was. Um, and he suggests that there could be genetic uh, correlations that we don't know of, that emphysema uh, might create a, a, a local milieu that, that helps the, the, you know, the, the, the persistence of carcinogens because there's, there's a, a difficulty to, to exhale the air that you have in, in, in emphysematous lung and, and so the carcinogens stay there for longer. Or, or it's a matter of the, 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 the matrix around uh, emphysematous lung that, that, that facilitates the growth of, of lungs. I mean, he, he brings up very neat uh, theories, but basically it's not known. And, and I know that there are many people studying. Um, so your first question, the difference between mild and, and Nelson, there really isn't any. No, Nelson uh, shows just like uh, an LST, a difference in mortality. They, they, they were not looking at survival. They were looking at difference in mortality between the control group and the treatment group. And in both cases, they found a reduction, a significant reduction, greater than the, in the NLST and mild, even greater than in Nelson. So it's the, the, really the only difference between them is that in mild, they did screening for many more years than at, at Nelson. Nelson did only four years or four rounds of screening and the NLST did three rounds of screening. So th that's the big difference between these, these three trials. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the great lectures, Dr. Silueta. Uh, if there are no more questions, I guess uh, we'll take a brief uh, five minute break and we can come back at, at